I am Vinny Todd Everton, folks. Here we are again on the Friday show. Your good intentions have been stolen. Don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. It may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean guaranteed. Uh, folks, she has not been on the show before. Uh, it's a real get to have her sitting here recording. I had her esteemed husband on man, maybe a year ago, Dr. David Unwin. Uh, and I asked David at the time, I said, hey, I think you can uh, over the dinner table tonight, maybe uh, just put a little <clears throat> bug in Jen's ear. Maybe she'll come on one day. And he's like, well, I'll see what I can do. She, you know, she doesn't listen to anything I say, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, at any rate, uh, here she is, folks, Dr. Jen Unwin. How are you doing, Doc? Really good. Thank you so much for the invite. I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, and, you know, obviously, you know what you're talking about, because you're sitting in a library with a lot of books behind you, which means that you're really smart, right? <laughs> Most of these are photo albums, actually. But yeah, we, <laughs> we, we, put the, uh, we put the Zoom thing here, especially so that we looked intellectual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, if I ever did that, um, you know, I, I would have to go through and pick out all kinds of great books, you know, and, and you know, it would just be too much. So for me, um, I just have a, a squat rack behind me. It's just a lot easier to do. And we don't have to change my office too much. Jen, um, you you're talking about something and th that's near and dear to my heart. In, in many ways. Um, I'll start off by telling you a story. And you can jump in whenever. And there's a guy, everyone who follows me knows this guy. Uh, he's uh, my good friend. Uh, we call him the billionaire, Don Coddington. He's not a billionaire. And um, Don, Don is this great guy. We were born like a month apart. We met probably 15, and not even 15, like 10 years ago, and we just became instant friends. And he's interested in health. He's been interested in lifting weights from the time he was a kid, and he was a marathon runner. He's done it all. But at 50 some odd years old, we, I guess we met when we were 50, maybe 49. He, he got in contact with me because he was morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. which is odd because he was still working out. He was still doing aerobics. He was still climbing. He climbed, um, uh, he went to Zermatt and climbed, uh, uh, oh, geez, um, the Matterhorn. And all of a sudden, as a morbidly obese person, he's climbing the Matterhorn, for God's mm -hmm. sake. This is no easy feat. No. Right? So I thought that was really interesting that with all the exercise it takes to climb mountains, this guy couldn't lose a pound. And that's why he got in touch with me. And we just became fast friends and started climbing together. We climbed uh, Whitney several times, all documentary, documented on this podcast. And Don, I would say to him all the time over campfires and in, in, in tents and on mountainsides and on glaciers, I would say, of all the people who have listened to me on the internet, people I have never met who have lost tens of thousands of pounds. The one guy who can ask me any question at any time and get any information from me at any moment, day or night, a guy that's been on mountains with me all over the place. Why can't you seem to get this? And he said, man, it's an addiction. Mm. It's an addiction. And I understand that. Yeah, I get that because I've been working with people and food addictions their entire life. Yeah. But until Don finally looked at it as if he was an alcoholic, which is what he did. He looked at it as a real addiction. Yeah. Was he able to lose the weight? Now he's at a comfortable weight. He oh. looks you know, normal. He's lost right. some weight. Yeah. But it took him a long time. What say you, Jay? Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Yes. So I don't know whether but now's probably a good time to tell my own story because it's really very, very similar. Um, so look, looking back 
now I understand that I was probably born that way, as was he probably. You know, some of us just are born with this kind of addictive thing that happens in our brain with sugar, well, sugars and grains and ultra processed foods. And, you know, my earliest memories are of foods. I can still kind of remember being really young, going to Sunday school, making cheese scones and eating them with hot butter on. I, I, it's one of my earliest memories, still still very powerful. Um, and I think some of just us just have that from early on. And then our lives then are a sort of struggle of trying to manage how much we eat, what we eat, our, our weight, you know, and, our, and until you start to, until I started to see it through an addiction lens, I, I couldn't solve it myself. So uh, as you know, David and I, so I found low carb a bit before David, I read a book called Escape the Dark Trap by a British yeah. GP called John Griffin. And I was reading daily bits of it and I was like, right, I'm, I'm going to do this. It really made sense to me, the whole low carb thing. I thought, right, yeah, I, I get that. I get the science. I get that it's going to work. I, I did. I'm a cold turkey person. So I went bang overnight, felt terrible for a few days. And then on about day eight, it was like, yeah. um, and I felt amazing. And that I thought that's that's the answer. That's it. And of course, it is to some extent. And I did do better and really well once I'd understood that about carbohydrate, insulin, sugars, etc. I felt better mentally, physically, less cravings, more in control. But it wasn't the ultimate answer because, like many people that you'll know, and I've just been speaking to someone this morning who did one of our weekends last October, who'd done really well. And then over Christmas, it's all gone to pot and she can't get back on it. She says, I know I need what I need to do. I just can't get back on it. And it was only when I started seeing the whole issue for me through an addiction lens. And that was thanks to Bitten Johnson, who you'll have heard of in Sweden, who's an amazing uh, nurse clinician who's worked with people for decades on this issue. Um, but now is training people as well. And I've, I've trained with her. Um, once I started thinking, ah, oh, it's an addiction. One bite is too many and a thousand is never enough. Yeah. I, I, I need to be abstinent. You know, it's no good doing keto baking. It's no good thinking it's my birthday. So I'll have a, a small slice of cake, um, because that never, never ended well. Um, and I've just got really fascinated by, by this idea and how do we help this proportion of people, it isn't everybody. Some people hear about keto low carb, they understand it, they see it's damaging for them, bang, off they take that information, they go off and action it. Um, but we had a group of patients in the practice, and I recognized it in myself, who could do that for a while, but then they would really struggle. And we'd have these sort of weight graphs that went, you know, down and then up again and then down and then up again. And we'd sort of have to keep going, going through it. But now we we, we you know, obviously David listens to everything I say. <laughs> he hears everything I say. So he's sort of brought this idea into his diabetic patients now. I've trained with Bitten and I'm really just committed to spreading the word that not for everybody, just like alcohol, some people can drink a little bit and they're fine. Uh, but some people can't moderate alcohol, um, but some of us just can't moderate sugar and grains and ultra processed foods. So we need to sort of look at it through that addiction lens. And I, I, I'm just really committed now to spreading that message and to finding effective ways. How do we help those people? Because they, they are a special group and it's not just about giving information. Because if giving information was enough, nobody would smoke, right? Nobody would drink. Right, right. Well, nobody would be overweight. So it's not about information. You know, it, it's interesting um, because, you know, going back, uh, I'll keep using my model of, of Don. And um, <clears throat> he, you know, he would see me, you know, I, as everyone knows, I, I, or maybe you don't know this. Um, in, in 2007, I had leukemia. Yes. And the way I beat leukemia was um, I, I beat it and then I, I just went low carb, you know, because they told me that my form of leukemia would be back within five years. 
And since I was already doing this low carb protocol with my clients in Hollywood, uh, I said, you know what? I pretty much do that myself, except for when I'm on the bike. I used to be this ultra cyclist and, and do all this stuff. This is the only time I would have carbs was on the bike because it was just so easy to do. And I, when I was off the bike, I would just cut them off. But I, I understood the addiction because going back to the alcoholic thing, you know, one is too many, a thousand is never enough. You know, that's the way Don is. Yes. I, live in, I live in dietary ketosis also because of a health issue. But if I have one little piece of anything, piece of chocolate, glass of wine, doesn't, as soon as my brain gets that hit, mm -hmm. I want another hit. I want to, I, I can't scratch the itch. I can't scratch it. The dopamine itch. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's the dopamine itch, itch that you can't beat. But I have this weird, weird discipline where when I'm going to do it, before I do it, I make a double espresso. I have it sitting there. So if I have a glass of wine, I was just, uh, I have this thing when I'm with my sister-in-law, Kristen, if I'm with her, I'm allowed to have all the wine I want because number one, I never see Kristen, right? Yeah. And number two, she's got really good wine. Yeah. So, you know, so whenever I have a glass of wine with Kristen, I always make sure there's an espresso right there. Because when I'm done with that wine, it's not like I want another glass of wine. I want chocolate. It's yeah. like, let me go see what's in the fridge. Maybe, the, you know, you yeah. mentioned scones. You mentioned it. I would be off and running. Isn't it interesting? Now, and, you know, it's all the same part of the brain. And that's, that's kind of why. We're, uh, like, like Bitten says, it's one disease, many outlets. So once, once we've got one addiction, alcohol or... or even caffeine, nicotine, food, you know, there, there can be that crossover, you know, and that's what we get when people get, they're successful at giving up smoking. Um, and we know that oftentimes people will, will put on weight in the aftermath of that. Or likewise, you know, if you see people um, recovering from alcohol problems, that they're, they're often eating lots of uh, sweets <laughs> to sort of get that hit in another way. Um, and so this this sort of um, crossover, and it's it's yeah, it's the primitive brain, and it it it, it just drives. It's just the, the dopamine hit, and dopamine all about motivation. You become super focused on that thing. That's where the, the sort of cravings are about. You become super focused on how do I get that thing? And of course, we're clever, aren't we? We've got that primitive brain, but we've also got this clever frontal lobes that all plot and scheme. You know oh, well, maybe one will be okay. Or, you know, well, if I just, you know, <laughs> if, I, if I just was to go down to the shop and get myself some um, bottles of water, you know, so you go down the shop, but actually, you know, that <laughs> you've got this sort of secret ulterior motive. And as you just pass the till, because right. the food environment's crazy, there's all these cues, you're, you're just going to be so much, so much more vulnerable to to picking something up and then as we all know once it's in the house you're going to eat it we're really cued by what we see by the smell you know that's why they pump the bakery smell out in the supermarket by the rustling wrappers by you know what whatever it is even if we're doing right. something like you know we we've been doing some kind of behavior and we'd always eat at that time like that you know the the food companies try and get us to snack while we're watching tv and stuff and then then you can't watch tv without feeling hungry and wanting a snack we're very trainable in, in the brain so it's in, it's incredible how much neuropsychology psychology <laughs> um you know all, all of this you know the evolutionary side of it is so fascinating to me as well how we're we're just driven to to do these things even though we know they're ultimately doing us harm and this is where i think as, as addicts, you know, we kind of really struggle because you think, well, I'm an intelligent, Dom's an intelligent guy. <laughs> I'm an intelligent person. I've achieved loads of things in my life. Why could I not control what I put in my mouth? I would come home from right. work, having decided it's Monday morning, like it's Monday today, we're speaking. Um, I would have decided, right, today's the day it starts, you know, no biscuits. Um, would come home from work. This is when we had small kids at home. And that, I know that's not an excuse, but at the time we did have biscuits sitting around. 
I would sort of watch my disembodied hand go and pick, pick up a biscuit or something I'd said I wasn't going to have and put it in my mouth. And at the same time, I'd be thinking, why am I, why is this almost automatic robotic thing <laughs> <laughs> happening to me? Am I, am I losing my marbles? And I think that's why a lot of us had a lot of sort of shame and embarrassment about how, how we behaved, you know, often in private, um, because it seemed not understandable e even to us if you like so that's the other message i want to get out that it isn't people's faults it's the it's the crazy world we live in and the way that we evolved our brains to help us survive <laughs> driving us to eat this stuff and the right. food manufacturers know this they 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 know that we it, it's not under our conscious control always um i want people to not not feel ashamed of these behaviors but to you know even so you can there's lots of things you can do to make it easier for yourself well you know a good friend of mine i was doing his podcast a few weeks ago he said maybe we should just start shaming people you know we we used to shame and we used to shame and we used to shame you know and i said you know what if shaming worked you know, these people are ashamed of themselves. Yeah, if shaming real. worked, it, it would have it would have worked already. Um, if fear tactics works, it would have worked because we all know about diabetes. I know David was talking about amputations. Right. We know with smoking, you know, they even put those ghastly pictures on the side of the packet. Well, you know, that that didn't stop people. What stops people is legislation and, and taking, you know, hiding them here in the UK, they're kind of behind curtains. Now you can't see them in the shops. You know, right. you, can't, you can't smoke in public places. Those sorts of things are the things that have really made a difference. Yeah. It, you know, that, that's one of the things I, you know, I was talking to Dr. Drew Pinsky, a, a, a guy here in the United States. Uh, he's, he was in both fat and fat, a documentary too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, Drew, we were talking on his podcast a couple of weeks ago and he said, he goes, you know, they show where sugar lights up the brain. He's an addiction specialist. He goes, yeah. you know, they show where sugar lights up the brain like cocaine, but it's not exactly like cocaine. And I said, Drew, here's the main difference. So let's say it's not exactly, I'll agree with you on that because I don't know what the chemical makeup, I don't know what happens in the brain. I'm not a doctor. I'm just an idiot. So let's assume that yes, cocaine is worse than sugar. Here's the main difference. Cocaine is an illicit drug and it's got a stigma. Sugar we give to fucking babies. Yeah, absolutely. Tell them it's okay. There's loads of reasons why I think sugar is actually the toughest to kick. So we have it, yeah, we, it's given to little ones. We have it all our lives. We don't give them nicotine. On the whole, we don't give them caffeine too young. We don't give them alcohol. Um, it, it's it's linked with love and family celebrations. And I mean, every celebration now, every, every kind of nice thing that we do, holidays, Easter, Christmas, <laughs> birthdays, Mother's Day. Yeah. It's, all about, it's all about chocolate, Valentine's. It's chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Um, so there's, there's, there's that link. There's also, I think, another really valid point, which is, you know, we don't need cocaine to survive. We don't need nicotine, caffeine or alcohol. We need, we have to eat. Right. So it becomes really difficult for people to, to work out an abstinent food plan. Like, what do I not need to eat <laughs> to be a food addict in recovery? Um, and that that's so individual and quite complicated for so obviously sugar grains ultra processed food i mean that's that's practically all that's all of us really that's that's yeah. the key problem but then a lot of us have developed problems with some other things that we that we can't moderate but you don't want to cut out everything and um, unnecessarily because obviously we need to eat things that are good we need a healthy sort of balanced diet i'm i'm not a, a medical doctor or a nutritionist i'm a psychologist so i i don't tell people what exactly what to eat um right. just like you don't tell someone who's given up smoking what to breathe you just say well breathe <laughs> breathe <it>. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. uh you know just don't have the nicotine right so we, we start with don't have the sugar and the grains and the ultra processed foods and then you have to work out what's what's going to work for you what 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 gives you a sense of not craving you're not 
you know, you know, you, you don't have those weird behaviors around it. So some people have those weird behaviors still around. Right. So I'll give you an example from from me. And this is where the whole keto thing, keto is good. But actually, some of the things that are OK in the keto world aren't really very good for for sugar food addicts. So like sweeteners, keto baking, um, other things that are considered keto, like peanut butter, for example. I had all the crazy behaviors around peanut butter. If it was in the cupboards, I'll be in it with a spoon. I couldn't, like, right. mod- couldn't have a moderate amount. So I just had to stop buying it and bringing it in the house. David doesn't like it anyway, so he doesn't mind. So, you know, we need to find our own unique um, solutions. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I get invited. I don't know why they keep inviting me to KetoCon. Um, Of course, they didn't have it last year because of, you know, uh, it's coming back this year. And the last time I was there, I guess it was in 2019 or 2018. I can't remember, but you know, 3,500 people ascended on uh, Texas. Uh, and and it was this wonderful event. Uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the speakers, I had a booth there with, you know, my vitamins and what have you, and everyone was wonderful and holding. And I got back on my podcast and said, Look, you know, keto is great, you can learn a lot. But if you walk the floor, where all the booths are, Everyone is trying to mimic sugar. You know, there are people lying to you about allulose and people lying to you about erythritol and people lying to you about stevia and stevia extract mixed with allulose, mixed with you name it. And I said, look, this is all BS. And I even put a button on it by saying, you know, whenever I would walk down the aisles, people, hey, then come here, you got to try my product. You got to. And I would always say, oh, just hand it to me. I, I just ate something. I'll try it later. And I'd bring it back to my booth and throw it away. And the bottom line was, mm. was I walked into a bathroom um, and I walked into a stall and, you know, it looked like someone had exploded in that stall. So, oh, my God. So I walked into the next stall and a splatter all over that toilet. And I'm like, I looked in all three or four stalls. They all had this diarrhea. Yeah. And. I was like, what's going on here? Yeah, it's so, not, nat- not natural. And it's also keeping right. that, keeping those cravings, you know, that that the sweet taste is just going to keep you in the it, it just keeps you it bridges that gap until you can get to your yeah. next piece of real chocolate and you're crapping your brains out because <laughs> it's your body trying to get rid of the stuff because your body does not want the stuff. But the yeah. other point I always like to make Jen is and I do this all the time when I do consults and everything else. What people don't realize is on top of the cravings, whenever I talk to morbidly obese people, and I do every day, five days a week, I set up appointments, I talk to them, I've been doing this for years and years. And I've I've spoken to 1000s of people now. Yeah, the one thing they all have in common besides the cravings is the fact that they say I'm never full. And I I can never eat enough. And it's like, okay. And I I explained it to him this way. I go, okay. When your body, when you eat sugar, you eat grains, you eat any kind of carbohydrate, whether it's complex, simple, it doesn't matter. What happens is your body, of course, we know releases insulin, keeps pouring insulin on that because it's trying to shove it into a cell. Simultaneously, you're releasing a lot of ghrelin and leptin. And these are two hormones Ghrelin is the hormone that's supposed to make you feel hunger pangs. It's time to eat. Yeah. Leptin is supposed to make you feel full. But when the when you're releasing this stuff all of the time, you're dulling those senses. You're 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 kicking that can down the road, and you those hormones can never do their job properly, um, yeah. and you cannot control it. As long as you're eating sugar, you cannot control those hormones. And the example I give is. If you walk up to a woman the day before she starts her period and you say to her, listen, you're going to start your period tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. I want you to concentrate really, really, really hard this month. Just don't have a period. She would probably slap you because the fact of the matter is she cannot think and, and, and really concentrate and stop that period from happening yet we ask people to do that with other hormones and it will never work. Yes, exact, exact. And it, it, 
I, I, it is why it's broadly accepted. I would say in that in you know food addiction counselors and um, people who are who are helping people with food addiction, obviously, obviously, no sugar, no grains, no ultra processed food. It, it's it's got to be the way to go. Those are the addictive things. They're the things that light up the brain. And that exactly as you say, there's that additional piece, which is that you're always going to be hungry in a kind of in a in a weird way. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, and that makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. I think it really helps to to know that, that your body and your brain think they're doing the best for you, trying to keep you alive, because they're trying to get you through this kind of winter time by eating, eating, eating. So you're putting on fat to get through this winter that never comes these days. You know, there's never any, never any, there aren't any lean times. So um, we don't need to eat for winter anymore. So it's it's fine to, um, you know, cut out the sugars and the, and the grains and the ultra processed food. And then you, uh, over time, the cravings and the hunger and all of these symptoms will disappear. And then I know you're, you're a big fan of Georgia Eid, like I am. Oh, yeah. And then of course, what happens is that you, the brain fog lifts, the anxiety lifts, the, the, the low mood lifts it, it, because you know, uh, who knew, but the body and the brain are connected. So once we, <laughs> once we get all that sorted out, you know, that the, the uh, our psychology is so much, you know, with, with our mental health, our well being is so much better. And then you're able to make better choices as well. It's really hard to make good choices when you feel like you're walking through treacle and just trying to get through that. <laughs> Maybe that's not a very good example. And no, that, just that, that's the perfect yeah. example. Yeah. 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 You shouldn't be struggling to get through your day. You, should, you know, we should be thriving, you know, yet we have so many people. And Jen, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but the smartest people I know, I, I've had the fortune of working with Fortune 500 presidents and Fortune 400 presidents. You know, the, these people are the smartest human beings on the planet and cannot figure out the one simple thing. They're morbidly obese, they're this, they're that. They can't figure out the simplest thing, yet they can run multi-billion dollar companies. That's how you know how strong this addiction is. Addiction and the denial, because, you know, when it, it, it's really tough for people when they start thinking, trying to think of it as an addiction, because of course the implications are, Never again, you're going to have to break up with this thing that that you love. <laughs> you have this sort of uh, lifelong relationship with, which has maybe been your coping strategy. You know, it's often the way that kids have got through really tough times. And we were just saying, weren't we? It's the only kind of, in a sense, drug that kids have availability of. And, you know, sometimes people have had difficult times and it's been their their way to get through the food you know with the food and the sugar it's a it's a soothing thing we do get the dopamine we get the serotonin we get the endorphins you get the oxytocin which is this kind of closeness neurotransmitter you know uh, each everybody has a different story but you know for some people that relationship with with the sugars and the grains is so fundamental to their psychology the idea of of, of giving up you know uh, some people are so very very defensive about it and often these are the people who who are pushing food so those of us you'll have had this yourself those of us who've given up these things it's unsettling to other people it's unsettling to other people who who have maybe a bit of an addictive relationship with themselves so they they they're the ones who are going to try and push us the cupcakes and the sweeteners and the you know just one just one won't hurt because um they they they're not at that point yet themselves of being able to sort of think that that this is an issue the person that i work with most closely in the uk heidi yevo is a nutritionist she was a very successful um engineer she went um she was you know high up in companies had amazing jobs and um she was never overweight interestingly but her her brain sort of stopped functioning in her 40s she lost her confidence she was losing her memory they were investigating her for early alzheimer's because that happened to her, her mother and and she had she did have the intelligence to do her own research and found out about keto low carb tried it and it's completely reversed that that process. Yeah. Um, so you know that it can be have make that much a difference to to people's psychological well being. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. I, I always harken back to a movie that was done in the night. I want to say the 19, late 1970s, maybe early 1980s. It was done by Ann Bancroft, of all people. You wouldn't think that Ann Bancroft would do a comedy, but she did a comedy starring Dom DeLuise called Fatso. And it, the whole movie, very funny movie, but the whole movie deals with, you know, food from the time you're born. Right. And, you know, they, they the opening scene is a baby's crying. Mommy whips out the breast, puts the baby on it. Baby stops crying. Now the baby's a toddler. The baby's sitting there crying. Mommy hands the kid some food, food in the mouth. Uh, yeah. Now that, you know, the kid is, is acting up in church. You know, this this is a montage scene that the movie opens up on. Right. Every time the kid is being agitated. Food, 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 you know, and then, you know, the, the scene that the movie actually starts on after the montage is there's a double wide coffin and the guy is dead, he's young and yes. he's dead. And that's Dom DeLuise's cousin and best friend. He can't believe Sally is dead and I, I must change my life or I will also end up like Sal, right? That That's the opening of the movie and the rest of the movie deals with you know you mentioned oxytocin he meets a girl at the sweet shop of all places yeah. you know I, you know when, when you first fall in love that oxytocin you know it's funny that someone like ann bancroft in the 70s was able to yeah. look at this and figure it out and say hey look this is what food addiction you know i could put it in a comedy and this is what it looks like yeah. right she understood it. And yeah. uh, you, you say about breast milk, I'll just go back to that because that's so interesting. Um, I don't think anyone's done it and I'm not sure how you do the study, but I, I, I'm, I wonder if bottle fed, so having, I always ask people bottle fed or breast fed? Uh, I wonder if bottle feeding actually has a bit of a, uh, an influence on those of us. So I was, I was bottle fed and a lot of people that I speak to with the food addicts, uh, were, were bottle fed. And of course, there was quite a lot of sugar in that, in that formula, wasn't there? So, uh, it, you know, it, 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 there's a genetic component for sure. So when I look back, my, my own mother was definitely a, a food addict. Um, but you know, maybe this early exposure issue is, is, uh, is important. And the other thing that reminded me of when you were speaking was, have you ever um, seen that baby's first ice cream? Uh, if you put baby's first ice cream into YouTube, there's a, a oh. Really sad where the little they give the kid the ice cream and his first ice cream literally grabs it with both hands and you can see his eyes doing this and he's kind of shoving it in his yeah. face. Um at that the brain is bing. You yeah, know, like that's what sugar does, you know, when they've they've not experienced it and, and, and then they do. And I do remember one time we we'd we'd been no sugar for quite some time. We went out for an amazing meal, uh, and we did that this is years ago now, but um it was an amazing restaurant and it was a very sugary dessert and we just kind of went oh let's have it and we both went, went i can actually feel popping i can always feel always feel yeah. popping in my brain and we both felt t terrible the next day and anxious and bloated and oh we really regretted it but yeah it, it was almost like that that experience again of experiencing it for the first time and little fireworks almost kind of bing, in the rain. Yeah. I had a girlfriend tell me once um, 30 years ago, you know, we would have ice cream once a week. She was way into health and fitness too. And like once a week we would uh, buy uh, some Hagen dazs or something, something really kind of pure and, you know, not without a lot of crap in it. And we would be watching television. And she said to me when I, and I never knew this about myself. She said, you know, I've noticed this for the past couple of weeks. I didn't bring it up because I wanted to make sure. I was like, yeah. She goes, do you realize when you eat ice cream, your feet, you, you start, you, your feet start moving back and forth. Like you, you're doing like a little happy dance. Well, you know, I'm, so I'm watching television and she's, I'm in a lounge chair and she's watching my feet kind of go back and forth on, yeah. you know, on, on the arm. And you were, and, you were actually kind of thinking, mm. <laughs> I, I never noticed it. I never noticed it, but Here's a scarier story. You know, I've been into this sugar thing since the 80s. People go, how did you get onto this in the 80s? And I don't know how I did. I was in college getting a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition. 
So I was just interested in everything, right? I was just a super curious guy. I was on a football scholarship. I couldn't believe they were giving me a free education. I was using it for everything I can. And um, um, <clears throat> every night while I was in college, at around six, seven o'clock, somewhere at night, I had to have a piece of chocolate. Yeah. Didn't have to be a lot. I had to have a piece of chocolate. I didn't think about, I'm not thinking about chocolate right now. I wasn't thinking about chocolate all day long back then. It didn't occur to me if I walked into five convenience stores, I never thought about buying sweets. I would go to the same coffee shop every day on Magazine Street down in New Orleans and get coffee two and three times a day. They had a whole rack, you know, like under the beautiful lights of, of scones and, and uh, croissant and everything, muffins, everything. Never thought that like it never occurred to me to go, I'll take one of those with my coffee. But come 6 30, 7 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. I was like, I will, I will cut someone for a piece. You know, I if I, you know, I will put a shiv in someone if I don't get a piece of chalk. Right. And this is going on in college. And I'm like, what the hell is what is this? Yeah. Well, I was home one day and I was at my older brother's house, <clears throat> married, kids. Six o'clock, seven o'clock comes in. He goes, uh, hey, you want a piece of chocolate? A piece of chocolate. I was like, hmm. I want a piece of chocolate every day at 6.30, 7 o'clock. He wants a piece of chocolate. So I didn't say anything. I came home a couple of weekends later. I made it a point to go back to Michael's house. Come 7 o'clock, he goes, hey, I got some ice cream in for you. You want some ice cream? Uh, I need some ice cream. You want some ice cream? I'm like, yeah, he's got the same mojo. Where's it coming from? Where's it coming from? It plagued me for about six months. It's like, and, and by the way, every day, six o'clock. And every time I went home, Michael, 6.30, 7 o'clock. Couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. And then it occurred to me. My mom had this spinster aunt who had retired. And in her retirement, she went and worked for the five and dime. I grew up in a very small town in the deep South. She worked at the five and dime. And on the way home, she would buy some chocolate every day from the five and dime and give one to me and one to my brother, Michael, and yeah. subsequently went down the street to my mom's brother and gave one to those kids. Right? Yeah, I called those kids. And I said, I called Will. I said, Will, you, you ever six, seven o'clock in the evening? What happens? I have chocolate every day. Yeah, it's not interesting. It started happening when we were three, four, five, six years old. And here we are, adults. Yeah, so powerful. And we're, you know, none of us, none of us ate chocolate all day long. Six, seven o'clock in the evening, you had to have a carbohydrate. You had to have something. It's crazy. So, the, so, so dopamine so linked with with reward, but also with, with habit. Um, and, you know, so it, yeah, you can get these kind of cravings and, and like, say, so you don't really know where they come from, but they've, that's obviously where they'd come from, from this sort of ingrained habit that that had happened time and time again, that your brain's expecting it at that time of the day. And we do a similar thing with coffee. Don't we, we have coffee at the same, you know, more or less the same time of day. I've given up caffeine now, but I still have decaf coffee and I still have those habits around it. We have our favorite mug. We have to have it in our favorite mug. And if our favorite mug isn't clean, we might even go ahead and clean it. We have our favorite brand. You have your favorite coffee shop. You have it. And um, we become very habitual and very opinionated about, <laughs> about how we, how we want it. And uh, that's, that's to, that's to do with the reward pathways. And yeah. And let me ask you a question. I don't mean to cut you off. Why did you give up caffeine and coffee and, and the whole thing? Yeah. So a couple of reasons. One was, um, thinking about this idea of, um, one, one disease, many outlets. So I've tried to give up everything that has an addictive component. So I now don't drink, don't uh, have caffeine, never did really smoke. So, um, because it makes the, the cravings for the, for the sugar and the carbohydrates less overall, if I yeah. have less caffeine. Yeah. So that was one reason well, was, I did it as an experiment to see, would that be the case? Seem to be the case. The other is that I'm a migraineur. So 
if I um, not quite careful um, with various things, I'll I'll get a migraine migraine headache. And uh, I was interested to see whether if I gave up caffeine, I'd have fewer headaches. And it, it's true, I I did. <laughs> so I've I've just never gone back to it. Um, yeah. I know some some people are fine with it. They can you know have as much as they want. David's one of those. I think some of us can't metabolize it as as well. Um, it has a much longer half life in some of us, I think, and uh, some people metabolize it fine. Uh, and if I accidentally have a caffeinated coffee, if someone accidentally gives me one in a cafe or something now, I am up till three in the morning kind of wondering what to do with myself. I think yeah. I'm just quite sensitive to it. So uh, I, I, I've just uh, stayed off it, feel better, feel better without it. I do like it, but <laughs> it doesn't yeah. like me. No, I, was, I was just wondering if it, if it had anything. Else. But, you know, it's funny because most people, my, my, um, my daughter, my stepdaughter, uh, goes through a thing with uh, she over her life. You know, I think it's more or less when she gets stressed out, she's an overachiever a high achiever. I don't know what you call these people nowadays, but she achieves a lot. And um, she would end up with migraines, right? Yeah. And, and we whenever she felt one coming on, I would quickly make an espresso and hand it to her even, uh, you know, as a kid, and we give her an aspirin and, and a cup of coffee and tell her go, go sit in your room, close your eyes, you know, because light can make and you know, it would just make it go away. You know, it would, you know, closing her eyes, getting, getting the light out, having the espresso, put yeah. an aspirin in her. I think sometimes what was going on for me was the, the headache was, it was a caffeine would, withdrawal. If I ever. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that could happen. Yeah. That, yeah. That can definitely happen. Um, the, the other thing that I, uh, I don't know if you've come across Angela Stanton and she's, she's written the migraine protocol. She's a, she's also in the keto space and um, she's, she's an amazing woman <laughs> and she talks a lot about electrolytes so i i quite often have a salt shot at night that's another thing yeah. that, that's really helped yeah i i should send you some of this uh, i hate turning anything to an advertiser the, the, my, my company makes this um ultra salt um yes. and what i did was um way back when you know i you know i've been an ultra athlete for a long time and Taking electrolytes are very important. And if you run low on your electrolytes, you you yeah. just go off. You know, you, headaches, body aches. You you can feel like you have the flu, right? You, you can't go low on hydration. Yeah. And um, so that's why I developed ultra salt. And I didn't just develop another just, hey, put salt with potassium and magnesium and manganese. Because I live near Amgen Corporation, you have all these scientists floating in the area. And I, I got in touch with a bunch of these scientists and I said, listen, I want to develop exactly what we lose in sweat. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I want the alkalinity. I want everything to be exactly. And they basically made me sweat in a bottle. You know, it's like, here's a bottle of sweat, you know. And um, I'll never forget the first year we were, we were the sponsors of, um, uh, bad water 135 bad water 135 is the, the hottest and, and probably the most grueling foot race on earth It's 135 miles. It starts in death Valley, it's usually 125 degrees Fahrenheit when the race starts. And the coolest it may get is at night where it might drop down to 105. Right? So it's a hot race. So I started sponsoring this race in this uh this uh, a professor from one of the universities pulled me aside and he goes, who are you? I was like, what? He goes, who are you? How do you know this? And I said, know what? He goes, we took one of your capsules. We, we dismantled it in the lab. We looked at it. This is exactly what you lose in sweat. How did you figure? He goes, you didn't just happen upon this formula. I said, calm down, doc. Calm down. It wasn't me. It wasn't me at all. I hired a bunch of people from Amgen and he was relieved to know that an idiot didn't stumble. <laughs> yeah. a lot of people look at me and go, you're an idiot. How did you come up with that? It's like, how did you make sweat? Yeah. yeah. How did you make sweat? And it's like, no, I didn't. I, I found some other people, but I can't. I think, I think it's really, really important. Um, uh, I, I'm a low blood pressure person as well. I just feel better if I have a high salt uh, diet, particularly with a low sugar diet, because you, you know, you, you, I think David explained when he did the podcast that he's been quite interested in, in how does low carb 
lower people's blood pressure and it's because when you lower insulin you lose salt at the kidneys yeah uh, so um i i have quite a lot of salt and as i say i do i do have electrolytes and particularly if i'm doing a little bit of fasting or something like that i'll de definitely uh up, bump up the electrolytes yeah you know it's interesting uh i had a guy um dr anthony j he's with uh mayo clinic uh he took my stuff from 23 and me or one of these things and oh, yeah. he takes it in the lab and he takes it to a different level like he finds other things and one of the things he said and serena was with me on the podcast that day she, she sat in and he said because of your makeup you need a lot of extra salt and she goes that explains everything because i'm pouring salt on everything i'm taking electrolytes all day long yeah. Of course, I'm expending a lot because even though I'm not racing anymore, just to give you an example, yesterday was football Sunday. You know, we have the playoffs. I did three hours of aerobics. I'm pointing right over here because I'm in my basement. I have a spinner and I have my rowing machine. I did two hours on a spinner and an hour and 10 minutes on a rowing machine. And I'm not training for anything. But my feeling is if I'm going to sit and watch that much football, I can't just sit in a chair. I have to be doing something right. So even though I'm not competing, I'm burning up salt, I'm burning out, I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning. And people think, oh, well, how many? Cal yeah, I got to take calories in. I ate a lot of meat yesterday, but you also have to put back in what you lost. And that's the point, you know, people don't realize that. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, a lot of people who give up in the early doors with with quitting sugar, you know, you do feel pretty bad, but the having the electrolytes and the salt is is one way to to make that transition a lot easier. People don't realize, you know, the first few days, you're going to need quite a lot more. And to that point, uh, one of the things I hear all the time is when people do the phone consults, and I want you to speak to this, they'll they'll say, Look, Vin, I tried it for three or four days, I can't do it. And I'll say, Well, why not? I say, Well, I felt like crap. I got that keto flu. I was fine with that, but I was so constipated. I had to have vegetables, I had to have grains. I said, Hang on. I said, You're gonna be constipated once or twice, maybe. But then everything regulates, and they'll say, Well, no one told me that. That's why I'm mentioning it here. Yeah. You know, what people don't realize is when you're eating a lot of fiber your system is not allowed to work, it, your system becomes lazy, right? Because the fiber is doing all the work for you. When you stop taking that fiber, your intestines has to, they have to start working like they used to, they have to start contracting and doing everything they used to do, the blood flow has to change. And it doesn't come immediately. What say you about that subject? I, what I would say is from a psychological point of view is that it's really important that people have that right expectation. As you say, you've got to give people you know, the, the, the information and the expectation of how long before they start to feel better, because some people do feel pretty grim. And obviously, if they think that's going to go on, on and on, they're not going to, why would you carry on with it? Um, that was quite, what was quite good in the book that I first read, this Escape the Diet Trap book, he did really explain why you feel grim in the first few days, and you know, to keep with it, because within about a week, you, you know, if you can just power through. So, you know, it, it, it's about, people having that expectation and having that hope that, you know, they'll come out the other side and, and they will feel so much better and then start to get the advantages. And I think if we can just get people, certainly people with a food addiction problem, if we can just get them to experience a period of that amazing off the sugar, mentally, physically, that, that feeling, even if it's a week of that and they feel so much better, that really helps us to help them keep on track because then if they if they fall off the wagon, um, we can say, well, you know, how, how did you feel while you were, you know, when you were, when you were doing it? And uh, most times when people fall off the wagon, they do feel worse. They feel ill. They feel, you know, like we were saying, you know, when you have, when you do have something, eh, you feel really bad the next day. And so I think if we can get people to a period of abstinence, we've always got that to fall back on to help them to sort of stay on track. All right, so, so Jen, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I, I'm I'm a person coming to you because I get this question. I know you do too. I want to hear how you how you would answer this, mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Unwin. Uh, my doctor told me my triglycerides are are 400. Uh, my sugars are in the 200s. Uh, my A1Cs are 11. They're telling me that, you know, if I keep up like this, my type two diabetes will escalate, and they're going to have to chop off a foot. 
Um, I will listen to anything you tell me. Go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how we, I always go as a psychologist, and this is what I've kind of trained David to do as well, is always start with people's best hopes. So, you know, if this was to, to work for you, if we were to, you know, it, help you to be able to, to lose weight, to get off the sugar, to reverse your diabetes, blah, 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 what difference is that going to make in your life? What, you, what might you be doing instead of, you know, all of this difficulties that you're having right now? And that's such an individual thing. It's finding that person's motivation and that, that hope, really. This is my kind of first love is, is how do you motivate people and, and get them hopeful about the future? Because it is tough. You know, it's going to be it's going to take some grit to get through. So they, they need that sense that you know, you know, maybe in six months time, I'll be playing with the grandkids, maybe in six months time, I'll be, you know, it's my 50th birthday, and I'll be in that amazing red dress or whatever. These are the sorts of things that patients have have said to us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let me be devil's advocate here. Uh, hang on. You know, I, I'll start saying that to them. They'll say, Well, what do I have to do? And I'll say, Well, you have to cut out sugar and grains. And they'll say, yeah, yeah. Well, Pizza and bread. And I'll, yeah. say, I'll say, well, I can't. And then, and then I'll say, well, I can't do that. And, and just now you told me you'd do anything not to have a triglyceride of 400 and a yeah. blood sugar of 200 and an A1C of 11. Now you're telling me you can't do that. What say you, doc? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. How do I mean, how do they? Uh, I, I kind of wouldn't. <sighs> so difficult, isn't it? Yeah, you see, it's really yeah, yeah, I see you're struggling yeah. because I struggle with it. It's yeah. like. You just told me they're going to chop your foot off. And, yeah. you know, that's why I always try and start with what, what would, what, you know, if it was to work, what would better look like? Don't think about how you're going to get there. What, what are your sort of best hopes for over the rainbow? And, you know, and then we'll, and what's already working, you know, nobody starts from zero. So they may have all these problems, but they, you know, sometimes they're walking the dog or sometimes they've, stop drinking or sometimes they've already joined a gym or something there's always something to kind of latch onto and, and build onto and then it's about trying to get from where they are now to this place where they want to be and it doesn't have to be nobody goes from a to z overnight you know we're going from a to b so you're here now this is what's already going well who's on your team you know have you lost weight in the past how did you do that you know how did you feel when you did that and right, we're, we're here now, we're at A, what's B gonna look like? So it's so much more manageable psychologically for people to think, right, doc, this week, I I am gonna give up having biscuits with my cup of tea. This is a, that's a very British example. Um, yeah. you know, I'm not gonna buy any more rich tea biscuits. Okay, right, I'll see you in two weeks and let's, let's see how you're getting on. Rather than, you know, for some people, the idea of, tomorrow you're going to have to just eat you know you you and i have a heavy meat diet meat and fat diet we've we've it's taken me you know several years to kind of get to this place and you know i certainly didn't didn't start off like that so they don't have to leap to where where we are today they just have to take the next step um and then notice you know it's this model that we've got grin which is goals which is the best hopes what's going well, resources is R, I is these little increments, like what's the next step? And then N is noticing, which is also really powerful. It's like, well, okay, so you've done two weeks off the rich teas. Um, how, you know, what have you, no what have you noticed about yourself? Oh, you know, I'm sleeping a bit better or, you know, yeah. I, my, my breathing's a bit better. And my wife says I'm not snoring as much. Oh, fab, you know, okay, you've done that. You've gone from A to B. What does C look like? You know, what, what will you be doing at C? And, just this, it's a slow, lots of support, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. People will, we've been doing it for 10 years in the practice. We've had people spectacularly successful, spectacularly fall off the wagon, get back right, on again, right. you know, but it is that long-term support. It's that coaching. It's that peer support. It's that just banging home, no sugar, no grains, no ultra processed food. You know, what are you going to eat instead? What do you mean? You know, it's, it's learning how to go there's so there's a lot to it but a lot of it is about support ongoing um yeah just just sticking with them and just i think it's 
you know, this is what obviously you you bring as well, just that that passionate belief in it because we've seen we've seen what it can do for other people. Um, yeah. we, run, we run groups um, in the practice and I run groups for people with, with food addiction. And what's fantastic is that when you get somebody having some success, that's, that's hope right there for the, for the newcomers and for the ones who are struggling. You know, they, the, the group process is, is it's, it's a very splendid thing. <laughs> Does some of the work for us, for the professionals, you know, it, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a very long-winded answer. But, no, but, uh, but it's a very good answer. You know, I, I use this one guy as a, as a pure example. Uh, his name is mentioned all the time. Uh, his name is Scott King. And there are now thousands of Scott Kings, but I can't remember everyone's name. And he's a great example. Uh, he had had, you know, uh, the, the gastro bypass surgery. He had gained and lost. He, he had hovered in the 400s to 500s to 600s for a lot of his life, he lost a couple of hundred pounds with gastric bypass, put it all back on. You know, I've always said you can't remove someone's stomach and fix their addiction, you know, right? It, it, you, you're removing an organ that they need and you're expecting the addiction to go away. No, you can. It's unethical to, to do that operation on someone with a food addiction problem because they're just going to turn to alcohol. They're going to bust the staples. They're going to, you know, anyway, oh, look, I was talking to a woman last week. She goes, uh, her insurance company is pushing the surgery. And I got on the phone with her and said, no, 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 no. I, I, I can't allow this to happen to you. You, you have to fix you first. And, and you see, Doc Syvis is so good at this stuff, isn't he? You know, he, oh, yeah. He, yeah. So I, know, I, love, I love Cyrus, and, and um, he's been on the podcast, I think, once, maybe twice. But at any rate, um, this guy, Scott King, you know, he had gained and lost the weight so many times in his life. And here he was, you know, coming up on 600 pounds again. And he's sitting in a chair, and his kids are playing outside. He sees his young daughter, and she's running out. Luckily, it's a quiet street. He sees her running to the, the street uh, to get a ball or something, right? And he's yelling, but the little girl is still running. And she runs out into the middle of the street. He cannot get out of the chair. And he realizes, even though nothing happened to his kid that day, <clears throat> that he could not even protect his own kids. Yeah. No one was protected in his life. Yeah. And he, he had heard um, Diamond Dallas Page do a yoga thing on, the, on someone else's podcast, Adam Carolla podcast. He heard that the day before. The very next day, Adam had me on talking about um, NSNG, low carb, you know, eat all the eggs you want, eat all the meat you want and the whole thing. And this guy looked around and said, you know what? I've tried every other crazy thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing this yoga the best I can at 600 pounds. Yeah. And I'm going to start listening to this guy's podcast. And whatever he says to do, I'm just going to do. Yeah. Well, Lo and behold, Scott King is now taking care of his family. Um, if his kid ran out to the road, I'm pretty sure Scott can catch that kid now because he's down to 250 yeah. and he's now done two or three triathlons. This is yeah. this, it, it, you're right. It's about somebody needs that why they need that thing that's sort of deeply connected to their values. So he's obviously a family guy, you know, his kids are so important to him and he, he was doing it for them. And you often hear, things like that, you know, when, when we're um, setting up the groups, we talk to everyone about, you know, their, their motivation and everything. And it's often, you know, this is the, it's my last chance, you know, like you say, I've tried everything else and, you know, I need to get well because, you know, the kids need me or um, wh whatever the reason is, it, it, yeah. it's really fundamental. Yeah, it, it really is scary where all of it is and where we're heading. Um, you know, I thought COVID would be a bigger scare for people because now we know the facts. It wasn't just morbidly, uh, it wasn't just old people. It was morbidly obese people who were dying. You know, that's morbidly obese. That's a comorbidity, folks. Listen to what it is, right? If you have that problem, anything can come along and take you out. That should be motivation number one to start eating right and making a plan. Uh, Jen, where can people get in touch with you? How can they find you? So I, I hang around on Twitter. So do do follow me on Twitter at Jen underscore Unwin. 
that'd be great because David's got so many followers. I'm I'm desperately trying to catch up. I'll never catch up, but uh, yeah, that that. So I I put things on there. You know, if we're starting a new group or. Um, and I have a clubhouse on a Wednesday night. I don't know if, if you're into clubhouse. So Wednesday night, 6 p.m. UK time. It's called Fork in the Road. So I wrote a little book in lockdown one called Fork in the Road. Uh, it's, it's simple. It's the book that I wish I'd had available to me when I was about 12. So it's, it's, it's written, you know, super simple. The sort of things we've talked about, like, you know, what, what is, have you got food addiction? Is it, you know, what is food addiction? How is it that it works and what you should do about it so uh fork in the road and the clubhouse room is called fork in the road every wednesday at six yeah i'm on twitter um there is a website for fork in the road called fork in the road uk um and the, the the book you can get through amazon and all the profits go to the public health collaboration which i know you know about because it's sam felton's yeah. charity in the uk and david and i um donate most of our speaker fees and anything any money we make to to that charity so uh yeah that's probably a good a good summary folks you want to go check out this woman she's got a lot going on and just like me she's offering a lot of help for absolutely free hang on jen i want to say goodbye to you off the air folks uh villa capelli is the longest running sponsor of this podcast and i'm pretty sure Jim would agree with me that olive oil, especially olive oil that's not packed with seed oils the way they do it here in the United States. Mm. Villa Capelli comes right out of Puglia. Um, Paul Capelli, along with his husband, Stephen Crutchfield, started that company. Paul's no longer with us. And when he passed away, Stephen said, you know what, I'm going to keep it going. And we are richer for that fact because Villa Capelli is 100% pure olive oil. You'll get that Puglia pinch. You'll taste that that peppery in the back of your throat. Yes, I do drink it straight, folks. That is not just hyperbole. I do drink this stuff straight. That's how much I love it. Villa Capelli olive oil. You want to save a lot of money? Number one, you want to get free shipping. So if your order is over $100 total, free shipping. Number two, buy in bulk. Get the three liter 10. That'll put you at almost 100 bucks right there. Number three, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, 10% off your entire order. So let's do the math. If you want to be over $100, you can't spend $100 and then get the 10% discount because as everyone knows, carry the one, that's like $90. So you're not going to, so spend about $115, get some herbs, get everything you, you want from Villa Capelli's website. When you get that discount, you're right over $100. You get the free shipping. That's a big savings on top of the 10%. On and on and on. Promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y. Go check out Fork in the Road uh, with Dr. Jen underscore Unwin. Uh, you'll find her on Twitter. She also has uh, a clubhouse. Maybe she'll have me on the clubhouse one week. Anna brings me on her clubhouse. Who knows? I'm, I'm saying this on the air hoping that uh, she would be embarrassed and go, well, no, I'm going to hear them more. Oh, God, I'd be so yeah. pleased if you come right. on Clubhouse. I, I think with, on Clubhouse. <laughs> with my help, we can beat David Unwin oh, at the yeah. Twitter game. Yes. Yeah. You, you know, or look, I mean, I get shadow banned on Twitter. I, you know, th this is a known fact. You know, I, I don't know if you know this, Jen, but my my Twitter account when I first got on, I up and up and up and up, and I got to like 35,000 people, and, and that was it. It's like, well, wait, yeah. I have three movies. I have a mega smash book out there and I have 2000 podcasts yet. And, and millions of people listen to this podcast in a month. But Twitter, I'm only at 35. Like I stopped at 35. Thought, it makes no sense. Same thing happened to me on um, Instagram. I, first week I was at a thousand. Second week I was at 4,000. Third week I was at 10,000. I got to 23,000. Boom, stops dry. How does that happen? You know, uh, no, maybe, that, maybe that's what's happened to me. I don't think so. <laughs> no, you know, look, the, the, you could get shadow banned. Uh, both myself and my buddy, Malcolm Kendrick, who lives in your country. Yeah. We, we both, our Wikipedia is just mysteriously went away on the same day, along with many other people who talk about eating high fat, low carb. Yeah. One day we're on Wikipedia, the next day, we're gone. And I had my attorney call Wikipedia and go, what's it's like, 
we can't verify that Vinny's actually a real person. That's what they said. We, we can't verify one fact about this guy. And because my wife is a celebrity, it used to say that we were a couple on her Wikipedia that was taken away. Um, my hometown, which is on Wikipedia, I was one of the famous people that came from that hometown, gone mm -hmm. away. They, if they want to wipe you off the internet, they can wipe you off at any moment. Crazy. It's just the way it is. <laughs> Crazy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the guy that did the movie, uh, the magic pill, uh, the Australian, um, great movie, by the way, it was on Netflix. People always say, why don't you put your movies on Netflix? It's like, because with one swoop, they could just say, no, we're not going to show this movie. They took the magic pill off of Netflix. Mm. So there you have it. You know, you got to really pay attention to what, how you're navigating this world because they, they, and you'll see this in my next movie. They're coming after people like you, me, David, Malcolm Kendrick, uh, Nina Taishos and I have had several conversations about this. Yeah. 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 They just keep coming. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Yeah. So, uh, folks, go check out Fork in the Road. Go check out her clubhouse. Check it all out. On behalf of Dr. Jen Unwin, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.